Hello and welcome to Inside View. I am your host, Joel Metzger, and I'm pleased to welcome David Vassar to the show tonight. He is a writer, producer, and director. David, welcome. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, it's, it's just so fun to have you on the show, and we have a very exciting uh, screening coming up on the 17th. Um, this is a, a retrospective on your career and, and your many projects. Tell us uh, the information so if people want to attend this, they know where to go. So the event takes place on uh, Friday, June 17th. Doors open at 6, the program starts at 7, and then there is a reception afterwards at camps. And uh, you can watch the, the retrospective for $20, or if you want to stay for the after party and meet you uh, over at camps, that's a $40, is that that's right? That's correct. And the tickets for both events are available at Eventbrite, that's E-V-E-N-T-B-R-I-T-E dot -E com. And all you have to do is search on A Walk in the Park with David Vassar, that's V-A-S-S-A-R, <laughs> and uh, it'll take you right to the purchase page and... Tickets will also be available at the door for cash or credit cards. That is if they're not sold out. Well, we're, it's moving along. We're still 10 days out. We're getting a little, little the, you know, normally my films run on television or they're in visitor centers or they're in museums. So they're always free. So this is a little, uh, this is a new experience actually worrying about whether or not you're going to sell out. And the Bret Hart Theater is just a great venue for Calaveras County, so that's fantastic that uh, people can really be comfortable and be in a neat space. Yeah, it's, it's a lovely venue, and uh, it's a nice screen, nice projector, great sound system. So uh, I've been working with Dave Dugan over there for oh, two sessions now, and I guess we'll do the first run-through on uh, Monday. And this is a, a one-time screening, right? This is the only opportunity people have to see this. So... We'll talk a little bit about the, how we got to where we are. Um, about three or four years ago, there's a, a, there's a film festival in Washington, D.C. called the Environmental Film Festival. It's one of the oldest and probably one of the most successful kind of natural history environmental film festivals that there is. And over the years, my producing partner, Sally Kaplan, and I have had three films uh, screen at the festival. So they're well aware of my work. And... One of the curators for environmental history, who's also a co-presenter at the Smithsonian with the Environmental Film Festival, kind of leaned over to Sally and said, when are we going to get David to do a retrospective? So as a, just as a little backstory, it's important to realize that I cut my teeth at the Smithsonian. When I was 20, I got a job there as an apprentice, actually 23, and really learned how to make film there. So there's a, almost a family connection to the museum. And um, so anyway, time passed and time passed and time passed. And two years ago, we brought California Forever there, the PBS documentary that Sally and I did about California State Parks, which aired on PBS. And they kind of nudged us a little bit and said, we'd really like to do it. And Sally kind of picked up the ball and said, okay, what do you have in mind? And uh, that was in probably June or July. And I... <clears throat> I really didn't realize how complicated it was going to be to do this because we've actually, we're presenting clips from, uh, well, the for earliest film was 1970. The most recent film was actually 2015. So we're presenting a retrospective of films that basically crosses 45 years of experience. It's tied to the centennial of the National Park Service, which we're celebrating this year. So about Nine of the films are about parks or national parks. Two or three of the films are sort of little added extras from the, from the vault that I wanted to share. Um, but the process of selecting the clips from, you know, you're talking about the potential of 30 or 40 films and trying to wheedle that down to 10 or 12 that have an environmental theme and then trying to figure out, you know, California Forever is two hours, so which six minutes do you choose? And as I was saying to you earlier, you know, the, the 
just because the, the film has an importance to me, or the, the sequence that we select has an importance to me, doesn't mean it's going to be important to anybody else, because I, I was there. So I know about the backstory and what happened, and you know, the fact that you know, when we did the Hetch Hetchy film with Harrison Ford, he landed his jet, which was actually too big to land at Pine Mountain Lake, when he went out to Hetch Hetchy to do the hosted sequences, and kind of caused a mini uproar at the airport and you know so I know that that is a really funny story but the audience doesn't know that you can't really tell that story so so that the one challenge was an aesthetic challenge trying to get trying to select a set of clips that would be interesting by themselves but also would carry an arc through the whole evening so that you and and it's we didn't organize the retrospective um, in a chronological way so the first clip is from 1970, the second clip is from 2001, the third clip is from 2015, the fourth clip is from like 1983. But what we did try to do is we tried to trace the history of the National Park Service from Yosemite in 1864, which is the first clip, through Yellowstone in 1872, through the Grand Canyon, which was I think 1906 with uh, Roosevelt setting aside the Grand Canyon National Monument. And then going all the way up into the current film that we're working on now, which is about um, preservation of California deserts, well, uh, in 1994, the Desert Protection Act was passed, which actually, it lifted the status of, um, of uh, Joshua Tree and Death Valley. They were national monuments, so the, the Desert Protection Act actually lifted um, the status to national parks. And Death Valley got another, an additional million acres. It's now larger than the state of Connecticut, and it is the largest national park south of Alaska, outside of Alaska. So it's, it's really an interesting story. And then, of course, just this year, the Obama administration uh, dedicated another roughly million acres, increased the size of Joshua Tree, increased the size of the Mojave National Preserve. So that just happened three months ago. So the arc of the... The, the arc of the National Park Service in the retrospective goes from the, um, the passing of the Yosemite Grant in 1864 all the way to the establishment of these new national monuments just this year. How long did it take you uh, from starting this project to having a final product? It's embarrassing to say, but, it, you know, I mean, there's three or four pieces to that. Um, one is an aesthetic sort of almost archival set of decisions you have to make. What am I going to include? What am I going to leave out? And as any filmmaker will tell you, it's a hell of a lot more complicated figuring out what you're going to leave out than what you're going to include. Because even if you're shooting a movie with 40,000 feet of film, which is roughly you know, 20 hours of material, uh, you know, after looking at the material four or five times, what scenes are going to be in, because that, that will speak to you. But what you don't know is what you're going to do with the other 19 hours of material. So um, that was one piece of it, was just making the aesthetic decision about what we're going to include. And then the, the technical side of it was overwhelming. I mean, we literally went back to the, the original negative and the original videotape masters of all the material that we had, and we literally put up negative on trees that hasn't been out of a vault since 1970 and um, remastered all the material to uh, HD. There's four or five films that are either 35 millimeter or were shot in HD or were shot digitally in 4K. So um, those were pretty easy to get them up to a, a, a sort of, you know, we tried to, we tried to get to a, a, a level playing field, if you would. But, you know, a 16 millimeter film that was shot in 1970 and a 35 millimeter film that was shot in 2001 and a 4K video digital cinema project that was shot in 2015. Well, there's some, there's some inherent, um, so shall we say, comparative issues with the, with the acquisition. So trying to get all that material into a coherent uh, uh, digital format, which eventually became uh, digital cinema files, DCP, which is what you go to see at a theater now. I mean, that's the industry standard. So we created a, we, we went back to the masters, we retransferred, new color correction. In a lot of cases, we did dirt and scratch. The first film I shot in Yosemite uh, is only 22 minutes long, and I selected about a four minute clip. They spent 33 hours removing the dirt and scratch. So it's, you know, it's, it was an incredibly um, 
painstaking, complicated, and extremely expensive process. And we were lucky enough uh, on the first go round at the Smithsonian to have uh, Subaru stepped up as a sponsor, and um, they, you know, picked up the tab to get us back and forth. They uh, sp spent some money on the restoration, but the laboratory in Los Angeles that did all the restoration, including the Academy of Motion Pictures uh, Arts and Sciences, uh, Arts and Sciences, I, the tab was about twenty-five thousand dollars. But because I have a relationship with them that dates back, they literally um, did the masters for my first film when I was nineteen. And some of the same people, it's, it's privately owned. It's a company called Photochem. And it's really one of the last laboratories left in Los Angeles. And they, their legacy is pretty amazing. So that was an incredibly complicated but really uh, richly rewarding process. Well, I, I'm so excited to, to see this retrospective. And I, I hope a lot of other people join us too. I think a lot of the viewers would be interested in, in just learning a little bit more about your history and, and how you came to be in, in all of the, the industry that you're in now. So take us all the way back. I know you attended film school, but when did you know this is where I'm going with my life? Well, I should go back further than that because um, my mom worked at 20th Century Fox from 1948 to 1978. So she was there like 40 years. And she worked in the music department. She worked with Alfred Newman and Lionel Newman, who are the, the uncles of Randy, right? It's, a, it's an extraordinary music, it's an extraordinarily musical family. So I was literally on a sound stage by the time I was five or six. And um, the studio was about a mile from my grade school. So on Thursdays or Fridays, I would ride my bike to the front gate and wave at the cop. And, go stage to stage or out on the back, back lot and watch people make movies. So, you know, it's, it's you know, sawdust in your vein. You know, it's, it's like the old circus family. So I am second generation, but, um, and then I started working as a bit actor when I was like eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And, and I, I actually was a dan I don't know how much of this you want to know, but I was a dancer at the time. And I got to the, I went through like nine, I auditioned to be one of the newsboys for Gypsy, the musical. And I got through like eight callbacks, and I got to the final callback. There were like six of us. They chose five. They let me out. I was, you know, 13 years old, and that was it. I'm not acting anymore. I cannot handle the rejection. I just can't. I couldn't do it. So... I forgot about filmmaking for a while. I got a job at the studio in the mail room, delivering mail around the studio. Again, I got the opportunity to meet some really extraordinary gifted people in the business. And um, I went to night school at City College in Los Angeles. I think it was $3 a unit. Um, and it was really a good school. It was really a good school. The first night of class, the the, there was like 14 kids in the class, and the instructor brought out an old 16 millimeter hand crank bell and how, and he brought out a little strip of leader, and he said, "This is how you load it," and you know you put it on this the feed reel, and you put it through the gate, and you put it on the take up reel. Okay, great. All right, now here's a roll of film. I want you to go into the dark room and load the roll of film into the IMO. Okay, fine. So 14 kids went into the dark room, and you know he was around to make sure that we didn't screw it up, and then we all came out, and he said, "Okay, so I want you to take the camera." It's Wednesday night, take the camera, go out over the weekend, make a three minute movie, cut it in the camera, and we'll screen them on, uh, we'll screen them Wednesday night. That was it. How old were you? 18. And from there on, this has been your path? Oh yeah. Where does, yeah. Your, where does the passion come from? I still hear so much passion in your voice. Where does that come from? I don't know, I'm Italian. <laughs> what can I tell you? You, start, you started, uh, you know, you grew up with this in, in, in your family, and then, and then you kind of, at 18, you said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. But, yeah. But your path has been really public lands and national and state parks. How did that take place? It's interesting for a kid growing up in L.A. It wasn't exactly, you know, it wasn't exactly imprinted at an early age. But um, uh, to make a long story short, I came up to Yosemite as a film student still at City College. And um, there were all these sort of counterculture people gathering in the meadows in Stoneman Meadow, just, which is just below Half Dome across from Curry Village, if you know the valley at all. 
And they were like playing guitars and making music and a couple of people were smoking pot and some people were drinking wine and people were eating watermelons and dancing and, you know, it was all Berkeley and L.A. kind of kids my age, 19, 20, 21. And the interesting thing was, this was a really polarized time. It was the Vietnam War. And the interesting thing was that there were a lot of people from Iowa and Wisconsin who had never like interacted with a counterculture person before. And they were like sitting down in the meadow and talking to these kids. And I said, wow, this is really, really interesting. I think I'll make a movie about the healing power of nature. That'll be great. So I came back over Fourth of July weekend in 1970 and I brought a crew of like five people, two women, a still photographer, assistant cameraman, a sound person, myself. and. Uh, Okay, so we're going to make this movie. So we get there, and now we're heavy into the 4th of July weekend, and what were 60 or 70 counterculture people is now like 350, 400 people out in the meadow. And people are coming in from, you know, there's like a, an underground railroad. People are coming in from Berkeley and L.A., and the hotels and the concessions in the park are getting really, really anxious because this is turning into like a hippie love fest. You know, there's some really, you know, sort of, shall we say, um, well, it was just counterculture stuff, you know, that's, let's just leave it at that. So the Park Service came down pretty hard. They put up signs. They closed the meadow. And uh, on the 3rd of July, which I guess was Saturday night, they ran the kids off the meadow on horseback. Um, you know, like 20 National Park Service rangers with, you know, uh, day-glow orange fire helmets on, on horseback with axe handles riding across this meadow, um, chasing the hippies. And uh, it got pretty ugly. And a lot of people got arrested. I think 125, 130 people got arrested. They closed Yosemite Valley. Um, and I was arrested because I was, I was filming. And for some reason, the Park Service gave me the material back the next morning. And the, they gave me my camera back. And the film was still in it. So I had the only film. So we made, we, that, by the time we got back to L.A. and developed the film and, and realized that we got it, it was only two or three days, but we made the CBS Evening News and we made the, uh, the sort of uh, the national section of the New York Times and the Washington Post. They actually took 16 millimeter frames and, uh, and, and put it in the newspaper. So that was pretty cool. You know, I mean, right place, right time. Okay, this is working. You know, I mean, it was... It was this very, very weird, crazy couple of days. So long story short, the film won a little student film festival in Los Angeles. And I got a, I can't remember if it was a phone call or a letter, but I was told that the director of the National Park Service was going to be in Yosemite and he wanted to see the film. Now, why he didn't just ask me to send him a print, I don't know. So I went up to Yosemite and um, I screened the film for director George Hartzog at the time. And he's a big guy, you know, he's like, at that time he was, seemed to be towering, but, you know, he smokes a cigar and he had a 10-gallon Texan. And, and it was, he was deeply disturbed to see these, his beloved rangers engaged in what a eyewitness told the New York Times was a sickening spe spectacle, quote-unquote. And the house lights came up and he was, I mean, it was just him and me in the auditorium. He was dead silent. And uh, he said, let's go for a walk. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure that's such a good idea. So we, long story short, we walked out to the superintendent's bridge, and we sat down, and we talked for about an hour. And at the end of the conversation, he said, well, you seem to know what's going on here. Can you think you could come up this summer and, and do an evening program for these kids that we, we can't seem to reach? So for the next three summers, myself and six other volunteers, which we, which we, which we called the Yosemite Light Brigade, um, did these evening programs for young people. And that was, that, if you really think about it, the, the content that we were producing, you know, we did live shows seven nights a week. Slide projectors, acoustic music, comedians, uh, you, know, uh, you know, talks on transformational Buddhism and transcendental meditation, really kind of out there stuff. And uh, on a good night, we had 600 people. So, you know, and, and if, you really, if you really look at my films from that point forward, the content is pretty much, that's the content. It, you know, what, what we did over those three summers was try to create programs that would introduce the park to the people who may not 
have had a an experience of that place. You know, people are not really equipped when they come from an urban environment to a place like Yosemite. Okay, there it is, take it. You know, they don't really have the, they don't have the handrails, they don't have the geological information or the flora or the fauna. They really, they don't know what they're looking at. I think most people who go to National Park think it's like a big amusement park. You know, they don't, really don't, you know, they don't, and so we just tried to create programs that would introduce the place to as many people as we could, and that's kind of what I've been doing for the last 45 years. What was it like for you personally to spend those summers in Yosemite? Awesome. <laughs> it was great. I mean, it was just, it was, you know, it was very idyllic. I mean, you're working in Yosemite Valley. You're working with basically six or seven people who are your age and a little younger. Nobody was getting paid. We were all volunteers. Um, we built, you know, the, the, the Park Service didn't want us in the campgrounds because we were like, you know, we were the counterculture folk, you know. So they, the Happy Isles, the parking lot at Happy Isles had just been bulldozed. You know, this is when they started restoring the valley. So there was a little section of Happy Isles. We, you know, we built a screen and maintenance brought out like, you know, 75 stumps, you know, for kids to sit on. So it was great. It was like, uh, you know, it was like, a, a, like an idyllic summer camp. It was fantastic. You told me one time that where you really honed your craft was with your work with the Smithsonian. So I don't, I don't want to skip too much of your story. No, no, it's fine. It's, that's next. Br br bring, us to, bring us up to the Smithsonian. Yeah, well, I, um, after I worked for the Park Service for three years, a job opened in Rock Creek Park. So I was, se I was seasonal at that time. So a permanent position opened as a photographer in Rock Creek Park. And I said, what the hell? And I really wasn't happy at college. I wasn't really learning anything. And, you know, film is the kind of craft where you have to do it. You know, you, you've got, you know, you have, to, you have to make something. You have to show it to a group of people in a dark room. You have to watch the audience. And you do that, you know, 20 or 30 times, and you start to figure out what works and what doesn't. So I dropped out of college in San Francisco, and I took the job in uh, Rock Creek Park as a photographer. And that was really, that was wonderful. And living in D.C. was really great. You know, growing up in Santa Monica in the 1970s was a little bit like Oklahoma with a beach. You know, it wasn't terribly uh, culturally inspiring. It was a, actually a pretty dull place other than, you know, body surfing and going to the beach. So while I was there, a position opened up with the Smithsonian as, as an apprentice, and they had a small film unit that was actually founded by uh, the great designer Charles Eames, and he served as sort of uh, stylistic overseer in absentia. He lived in California, would come out once a month and check on the cuts and, you know, kind of give us sort of style advice. And uh, it was basically myself and the producer, a woman named Karen Loveland, and the, and the, and the editor, cameraman John Hiller. And so I stayed there for five years, and two of the films that I made for the Smithsonian actually won Emmy Awards and ended up on, on public broadcasting, national television. I was like 26 years old. It was, it was great. It was really great. So the, the bottom line about the Smithsonian is, is that particularly John, uh, John Hiller, the cameraman editor, he really taught me how to make films. So that was... and, and after I, uh, after I left the Smithsonian, I stayed in Washington and kind of got wind of a, a really interesting group of people up off the coast of Massachusetts that were my age again, my, my generation, and they were building the largest generator, uh, the largest windmill in the world to generate electricity. And they were literally building this thing by hand. And it was, you know, it was a 60 kW machine, which was enough to power the 140 households on the island. Uh, uh, up to that time, all the power from the island came from a diesel generator. So I went up to scout and meet everybody. And, I, and, and because I'd worked at the Smithsonian for two or three years, I had, a, I had developed a curator sense of what, you know, the, the most important thing that curators do, particularly those that are working in contemporary history, is that something strikes them and they have a hunch this could be important. Maybe it's not important now, but 30, 40, 50 years ago, 50 years from now, this might be important. And that's exactly what I said. I don't know if this is going to be important or not, but it might be important. So uh, I put a crew together, and we sp I raised some money from my landlord and my lawyer, and we spent about a year and a half making a documentary about this group of 
backyard mechanics, essentially, and artists, and environmentalists, before that was really a word. And um, they built it, and it worked, and uh, the movie one was nominated for an Academy Award. So, you know, I was 28 now. But it was, you know, it, 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 it just worked out. And it, if it hadn't been for the time I spent at the Smithsonian, there's no way I would have had the craft to make that film. So, Walk us through, and we only have time for just kind of bullet points, but yeah. you've made so many films. What are some of the locations that you've work, worked on throughout this, the nation? Well, I, I basically, I've been on six continents. The only one outstanding is Antarctica. So I did, you know, a film about great white sharks in South Africa, which w I did a film about the treasure of Tutankhamun at the Cairo Museum, and we ended up shooting at the Cairo Museum after dark while it was closed with all of the, you know, the iconic life mask of Tutankhamun. That was definitely a high point. Just literally, it was just a crew and I and a half a dozen curators. You know, can you move it this way a little bit so we can get a little more light on kind of thing. That was very nice. And uh, I've shot pretty, a, a lot in Europe and I, I did, uh, I lived in Hong Kong for six months shooting a film about the handover of Hong Kong to China, which was really a political economic documentary as opposed to natural history. Um, but the films that have been the most exotic, and you know, uh, 18 days on the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon with five world-class musicians is really nothing to sneeze at either. That was a pretty good experience. And that is, that's Canyon Consort that's going to be part of the uh, walk in the park with David Vassar at the uh, Bret Hart Theater on uh, the 17th. So that one is, that's, a, that's about an 11-minute clip. So that, that, that's a real nice film. So we just have a minute left, but wh what do you take away from this retrospective personally? Well, uh, there's a couple of things. Some of them are pleasant. Some of them are incredibly unpleasant. Um, you know, now that I'm north of 60, my, f my, my films are shown in museums, and I'm having a retrospective. <laughs> so that's not really great. But, um, you know, I think that the most, the, most, the most interesting part of doing this, and it has been a creative journey, is that it's really the first time in my life that I look back across you know, who the hell looks back across their career when you're too busy living, right? I mean, that's kind of the American way. You know, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. But um, to be forced, because we had this commitment to present the show, to sort of take stock, figure out what's working and what's not, looking at films that you despise the last time you saw them, I mean, that's the most incredible thing about film is that, you know, a film that you hated when you made it, the film that embarrassed you, that you thought, Jesus, no, this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. You know, there, there are some screenings you go to of your own films when, you know, people are like walking out, which is pretty heartbreaking. But um, the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of the films that I thought were just unwatchable are actually pretty good. You know, and it's, and it's only because um, film is what it is. It's a, it's a, um, it's a snapshot in time. And if, if, you, if, you, if you're lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time, then that little moment in time takes on a significance all its own. A Walk in the Park with David Vassar, June 17th at the Bret Hart Theater. Get tickets online. Search for your name. They'll come up. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Pleasure. Appreciate it. And thank you for joining me on this edition of Inside View. I'm your host, Joel Metzger, and I hope you join me next time.